All right, we are back with our next speaker. Um, now we have Javier Santana. He is the head of digital education at Lingoda. And today he's going to talk about um, whether teachers are replaceable. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Javier. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Megan. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone uh, for the possibility of being in this uh, very interesting uh, conference. Uh, I have learned a lot about uh, uh, the other uh, speakers, everything they have said, I found it super uh, um, insightful and uh, very enriching. Uh, I hope my presentation also kind of like uh, goes along the same lines and can also uh, uh, provide for an interesting conversation. Uh, so, but uh, first, um, a couple of words about uh, me. So, uh, I work at Lingoda. Lingoda is uh, Europe's leading online language school. And uh, I like to uh, present it using this definition. I think it's a very nice definition because uh, we really think uh, of ourselves as a language school operating online. So, we have all the elements that uh, offline language schools have, uh, such as, uh, for instance, um, um, teachers, uh, classes, materials, uh, a structured curriculum um, um, with a series of topics. Um, concept, uh, concept as, a, as, a, as an offline school would have, but everything online with all the flexibility that this entails. Uh, this means that uh, you can book classes at any time. Uh, you can uh, also uh, choose the topic that is more relevant, most relevant for you. Um, and uh, you can uh, choose either private or group classes um, and we also have that this is very important and kind of it's kind of the point of the presentation also uh, our classes being led by by language teachers who are qualified native speakers right um so and then a little bit about me i am uh, the head of digital education i uh, i have been at lingora for quite some time now three and a half years and i lead the team of instructional designers who are in charge of lingora's uh, lessons uh, so we produce the lessons that both teachers and students use in our classes uh, in all four languages, right? So uh, now let's move to the topic of the presentation. Um, this is a topic that I really wanted to address uh, explicitly because I uh, I have a I have had always uh, the feeling in the ed tech world that this is a topic that keeps uh, coming up and that everybody has kind of like a strong opinion about this. I personally have a strong opinion about this, and I want to share it with you and uh, and uh, provide you with uh, some theories, some arguments, and some perspectives uh, on why I think uh, what I think about this topic, and uh, and we can uh, um, have a, have a discussion about this, um, but. Uh, um, well, I think what is important is that people who have uh, uh, one uh, vision about this and another vision can come into a conversation because I have a bit the feeling that um, it's generally uh, uh, kind of like parallel worlds and uh, we, there, there's no real conversation uh, between uh, between the two, right? Um, so uh, are language teachers are language teachers replaceable, right? Um, so uh, in a communicative approach, we all know that uh, it's about conversational practice. Uh, and, uh, Scott in his presentation made a very nice distinction between the uh, linguistic competence and the uh, communicative competence. And I, I believe this is, this is crucial. Uh, in the uh, last decade, in the 2000s, um, there was a lot of uh, um, advances made in um, um, linguistic research and uh, in uh, research about uh, on in the topic of uh, learning languages. And uh, it basically was established that the communicative approach really uh, goes along the lines of uh, um, making um, language learning something that is that is uh, plays an, an important role in the life of, of our students because it is really all about communication, right? Um, people who know me <laughs> know that I like to compare learning a language with uh, learning uh, how to play a sport. And uh, for instance, imagine that you want to learn how to play tennis and uh, I don't know, you learn by heart all the rules. You know how many points you get if the ball falls here, uh, how big the field is, etc. But uh, at the end of the day, then you start, you go to a, to, a, to a tennis match and you don't really know how to even hit the uh, racket and the ball, right? Uh, this is because there's a mismatch between what you have learned, which is a theoretical uh, thing, and the practical element of actually doing it, right? And I, I believe it's the same with language learning. Uh, if you want to learn how to speak a language, there's no way around it. You have to speak the language. And at the beginning, you'll do it wrong. But with time, uh, you'll get better and uh, you will uh, achieve uh, uh, fluency, right? Um, so I, I kind of like playing on this metaphor. Um, 
we could think, okay, um, if uh, if language learning really should focus on the conversational practice in order for students to acquire this fluency, um, what is the role of a teacher? What should teachers do in this context, right? Because we all have in mind this uh, idea of the of the teacher as kind of like some old fashioned uh, lecturer who just brings in the topic and uh, basically repeats what uh, he or she has been repeating uh, for, for their whole life uh, without really considering whether the students are understanding it or not. And then there's an exam, you repeat it and uh, you get it, right? So we all have this uh, kind of like old fashioned idea of the teacher as a lecturer. Uh, but what I want to uh, discuss with you is an, a new redefined concept of uh, what, a, what is a teacher that actually has been uh, developed in the decade of the 2000s uh, up until the 2010s. Uh, uh, but uh, interestingly enough, because from the 2010s on, uh, online learning kind of like appeared and, and broke out and became the bigger the biggest thing in in uh, uh, in the area of learning languages. Um, it, it looks like all this research and all these advances and all these innovations that were done in the previous decade kind of like didn't really catch on because uh, online learning kind of defined itself as a negation of uh, this old idea of uh, a teacher as a lecturer, which was something that was already happening uh, in the offline uh, learning world, right? And this is something that I wanna discuss with you, uh, uh, this new role of the teacher that uh, um, was defined a couple of years ago and uh, also uh, how online learning can profit from that, right? Uh, so basically, yeah. What should teachers do in the context of uh, a communicative approach that is uh, about conversational practice? But before I go there, <laughs> I wanna, uh, uh, discuss with you and kind of like uh, start the, the, the whole uh, conversation with a, a feeling that maybe you share with me. Uh, and let, let's see what happens in a context where in a, in a situation or scenario where there's no teacher and what are the consequences, right? So probably if uh, you uh, also have experienced learning languages, you can relate to this feeling of uh, not knowing why something is the way it is uh, in, in linguistic terms or why uh, uh, a sentence is built in a certain way or why in German you use this case and not the other case or why you use that verb or uh, uh, why you uh, uh, use that word, the word choice, etc. And uh, what you do it, when you have this, this linguistic trouble, you uh, uh, talk to a native speaker uh, who's fluent in the language, who's supposed to know, and you ask why. Right? You ask, can you please uh, let me know why uh, uh, this is that, like that? And why uh, do you build the sentence in this way? Or why do you use the word in this way? And you typically will get answers like these ones. Uh, it just sounds right. Uh, it's something that I've been saying all my life. And uh, I don't exactly know why. I don't have really like a very strong reason for it. But it just sounds right. <laughs> Another uh, answer that you might get is just, just the way it is, right? <laughs> it goes in the same lines uh, and uh, kind of like, focusing on, on the idea that I just know that this is the way uh, that uh, that you're supposed to do it, but I don't really have a reason for it, right? Another one is, I don't know why it's wrong in it, like, like what is wrong in it, but I know it's wrong, kind of. And this I get, for instance, this one, uh, you can ask the sentence who or what. This one is, uh, is very interesting. You typically get from German natives uh, when you ask them about uh, the dative or the accusative, you know, the cases in German. Uh, uh, why do you use the, uh, the uh, dative in this case and not the accusative? And, and they typically tell you, you can ask the que the, a question to the sentence, like you can, wer oder was, right? And uh, this is very interesting. Um, why, like the reason why they give you this explanation um, it's because this is how they learned it at, in school. Like when they when they had to deal with the topic of uh, the cases in German, uh, uh, they were taught that you ask questions to the sentence, right? But interestingly enough, in order for you to be able to answer the question that you ask the sentence, so to speak, you need to already know the language, right? You need to be able to uh, formulate the sentence that you can ask questions to, right? Uh, so it's kind of like a, 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 an explanation that works for a native speaker, but doesn't work for a non-native speaker because uh, it kind of like presupposes that you know what you're actually asking for, right? Um, so uh, I did a little bit of research on this topic and uh, 
there is indeed a cognitive bias, and it's very interesting that Jennifer was talking about co cognitive biases before, because uh, it really builds uh, on this topic. There is indeed a cognitive bias called the course of knowledge, which is um, um, this this idea that you you like you're cursed because you know too much already somehow, right? And this is typically what happens to native speakers, um, explaining a topic in such a way that a previous understanding of the topic is necessary in order to understand the explanation, right? So my explanation uh, uh, is only understandable if you already know what the explanation is supposed to explain, right? Uh, so it's kind of like a little bit of a circle. Uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, that only helps you if you already know the answer, or it's a little bit similar to uh, defining a term using the term, right? So if somebody asks you what is a car, and you say a car is something, is a car is a car with wheels, right? Or something like that. It's kind of like, of course, you you you're not really understanding the thing because you're using the same term in the definition. It, it's a similar thing here. Uh, you're explaining something in order for you to understand it. You need to already know the answer to it, right? Um, so um, the truth is that having a linguistic intuition is uh, not correlative to the ability to adequately contextualize language input. And uh, I think this is important. So you can you can know more or less why that is the case and you can uh, uh, know that this is the case because you have the habit of speaking because you're a native speaker, but uh, this doesn't really mean that you really know uh, the, the, the the proper explanation. However, um, if you if you uh, check the slide, I chose the word contextualize better than explain because I think um, um, in order for 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 learners or for for non-natives to understand why you use a, a certain uh, structure in a certain way in a certain sentence, um, explanations are really just one way to achieve it and are not the only way, right? Giving a different but related example can already maybe sometimes uh, kind of like trigger the understanding that the learner is looking for, uh, or maybe uh, uh, refer to previous knowledge that the learner has through other linguistic structures that might be present in the student's uh, language or not, or, and uh, try, try to kind of like um, focus on the on the topic from different perspectives. So really like the, the, the bigger topic here is not in itself explaining or explaining grammar, it's more the ability to contextualize learning input, uh, so language input, sorry, in such a way that uh, students uh, understand it, right? So, um, so uh, then uh, we have seen already uh, one example, I, I hope you could relate to that, <laughs> of uh, a situation in which uh, not having a teacher uh, really uh, brings a disadvantage, uh, but is that really all there is, right? Like you could ask me, uh, hey, Javier, I think uh, that doesn't really sound that convincing. Okay, well, um, teachers can help you with the uh, grammar explanations. Is that's, that sounds really like the old fashioned kind of uh, way of teaching, right? It's like, oh, go to the teacher for some grammar explanation. Uh, but of course, <laughs> there's uh, there's way more than that. Um, and and this is this is why what I want to address now with you, like kind of uh, show you um, the the uh, what the role of the teacher uh, uh, should be if we define it uh, along more modern lines. And I I chose this picture, like it's interesting because <laughs> no no teacher from Lingoda accepted uh, to take a picture of them to put them here, <laughs> so I I had to look up a stock picture, <laughs> and I have to admit that it was pretty difficult to find this one because most pictures in this uh, stock pictures databases are really like uh, as you can imagine. Imagine, right? Like the teacher is in the center, a lot of children are looking at the teacher, the teacher is like with some blackboard or something, uh, pointing to some uh, uh, content on the blackboard, uh, kind of like this very traditional concept. But uh, even if it took me a while to find it, I really like this picture. And I want you to take some time to, to look at it uh, closely and to think about the role of the teacher in that picture, right? Like where uh, is the teacher uh, in this classroom? Like uh, in which position? Um, um, the attention of the students are pointed towards the teacher or are pointed towards uh, other students. Uh, what is the teacher doing in this class, right? Um, and if you take some time to look at it, you will see that uh, the teacher is not in the center. Uh, it's not like everybody's looking at the teacher, but rather people are looking at each other. Uh, the teacher is also positioned in the back, right? Like behind the, the students, uh, uh, kind of like not, not wanting to get all the attention towards her. And uh, it's also looking at a, at a student. Other students, interestingly enough, are also looking at each other. And they are. there's also some applause going. So there's some praise because 
probably one of the students was able to use a very complex uh, structure in order to uh, express uh, a very uh, interesting or beautiful idea. <laughs> and uh, and the teacher is uh, also kind of has this notebook in which uh, she can make notes. So this really goes uh, more along uh, more a more modern concept of the of the teacher as a as a facilitator, as someone who uh, uh, kind of like helps uh, um, in, in the, the linguistic exchange, uh, as opposed to um, simply um, uh, telling the students the content and expecting them to repeat it. Right? Um, so um, uh, please please bear in mind this picture. I think I think that's very nice. <laughs> And uh, now let's try to define the role of the teacher uh, with, with that idea in mind. So I thought I would uh, resort to uh, the help of uh, well, some scholar help here. Uh, uh, Bala uh, Kumaravadivelu uh, is a, a, a researcher on, uh, on teacher education uh, in uh, English as a second language specifically. And uh, for, uh, he's, uh, he's special, he's from the uh, um, University of San Jose in California. And uh, is also one of the theoretical references of Instituto Cervantes among others. Um, but uh, what, what uh, I, I wanted to share with you also a little bit what uh, the, the kind of like theoretical framework that uh, he provides uh, so that you also have a feeling for uh, uh, what what it means to be a teacher according to his guidelines, right? And the point that, uh, that he makes very strongly is that uh, being a teacher should not be so much about methods because in, a, in one and the same class, different methods uh, can actually be useful, like uh, for, for a certain topic, or depending on the on the student, also uh, um, maybe the um, natural approach works best. Maybe the communicative approach wor works best, or maybe the lexical approach works best. But if you have a student who really is very shy and doesn't want to speak all the time and doesn't really enjoy uh, communicating, forcing the communicative approach because there's some uh, syllabus that says that you have to apply it is actually counterproductive, right? So so what he suggests is that teachers should focus on macro strategies to deal with uh, uh, the, the class and to kind of like uh, have as a guideline uh, and uh, instead of really like applying a method that uh, uh, is very strict and very strong like a script, right? Um, so I wanted to show you uh, what is a, what uh, this macro strategy concept is, uh, a general plan, a broad guideline based on which teachers will be able to generate their own situation specific and need based micro strategies or classroom techniques, right? So it's more like a broad plan, um, but still a very systematic approach, right? So um, these 10 macro strategies, what I really like about them is that uh, I will show them to you right now, uh, is that they really provide an answer to this uh, question that we were asking before, what should a teacher do in the class, right? So have a look at them. Uh, I don't wanna like uh, go over uh, each of them because I think that would be uh, a bit overwhelming potentially. But, uh, but if you see there's stuff here, like for instance, raise cultural awareness, uh, cultural consciousness, sorry, or uh, uh, foster language awareness, promote learner autonomy. So uh, things that uh, go more along this more flexible and learner centric uh, concept that uh, uh, we all uh, uh, agree nowadays that uh, is, is the idea, right? And uh, um, if you think about the, the examples that I was giving before, uh, you have here that contextualize, contextualizing uh, linguistic input uh, is one of these uh, macro strategies uh, that uh, defines uh, what a teacher should do. And uh, I wanted to also go a little bit in depth about another one of the macro strategies, uh, but just one, because I don't think we will have time to, uh, to see any more than that. Uh, but I will, I will quickly pass through it because I also see that uh, we're, we're not really having a lot of time. I wanted to talk about um, the macro strategy of facilitating negotiated interaction, right? So um, what does it mean to negotiate in a class, right? Um, in order to understand this, this concept of the of, of the, the the strategy of facilitating a negotiating interaction and what negotiating means in this context, we need to ask ourselves: conversation in a language class. What is the purpose of it? Why why, why do we speak in a in a class, right? One purpose is the conversation itself, right? Uh, conversation is an end in itself, and uh, in there. Uh, you practice. This is a bit the idea that also uh, um, uh, Scott was uh, explaining before. But another way, another reason why you speak in a class is in order to learn the language, right? In order, to, so you talk to the teacher in order to ask questions, right? And this is 
the point that uh, I was also raising before. So you ask the teacher, uh, why do you why do you use this structure? Why do you uh, speak like that? Why do you choose this word, etc. Right? And uh, this is where a negotiation takes place. So uh, let me just quickly go through it here. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you an example, I think, because otherwise it's, it, 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 I don't think we will have the time. So imagine that uh, we have a class about the passive voice. And uh, I don't know, you have uh, the, the theoretical uh, input of uh, the passive voice. Uh, is, it's built with to be plus plus participle. And the subject of the action is submitted. Uh, this is kind of like some kind of unrelatable theoretical content that the student first sees and goes like, mm, it's written there. Uh, I don't know what that is. This is kind of like this foreign thing uh, of this uh, foreign language. Uh, but then after some interaction happens after in some negotiation where the where there's a uh, correction where there's uh, a, a double checking on, on what how how the, was it built etc was it to be can i say it in the present perfect uh, then that is the kind of like the 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 reason or the prerequisite for this structure to actually be something meaningful for the student and the student then internalizes it, right? And then the student understands that, oh, if I don't want to say who did it, uh, because it would sound like an accusation, I can actually use the passive voice and uh, said, all the cookies have been eaten <laughs> and not really say who did it, right? So this would be a meaningful use of the linguistic structure that uh, requires some kind of negotiated interaction, right? And in here, you can see that the role of the teacher is more that of a facilitator who uh, basically presents the content and then helps the student get there, but doesn't really like uh, uh, tell the student to repeat a, a, a kind of like a preset uh, linguistic uh, pattern, right? So it's kind of like uh, what uh, makes uh, the student think then that, that doesn't mean anything to me. Then there's some negotiated interaction. And after that, I can use that to express my own ideas, my interests and needs, right? It is the negotiated interaction that the teacher does with the student, as opposed to this uh, old fashioned way of explaining that, uh, that that happens in a class and that happens in a, in a, in a learning uh, environment um, that uh, allows the student to be in a position in which uh, the, this linguistic content that was too abstract and generic um, then uh, actually means something, right? So. Then I wanted to, uh, but maybe because we don't really have time, I wanted to finish with this uh, topic potentially. Are teachers necessary? Um, so I presented uh, you some uh, uh, ideas, some some uh, um, this, this concept of a macro strategy, this new way of thinking the role of a teacher, what teachers should do, a bigger focus on cultural elements, a bigger focus on learning autonomy, etc. Uh, and uh, does it does it mean that? teachers following this approach also are necessary. And uh, my point in here is a bit of a more nuanced one. Um, I think teachers are not really strictly necessary because learning can happen also in other environments. Learning is, is a, a very uh, a process where there are many factors and there's also an element of randomness, if you want, in it, uh, because it, it is really about personal uh, about the personal experience and making uh, uh, things meaningful. Uh, so the necessity is kind of like a very high bar for this, but uh, I like to better say that teachers are vital to education, right? Uh, in the same way that, uh, for instance, a doctor might not really be strictly necessary to get you, to get you out of your uh, uh, sickness, but you want a doctor to help you if you're running into trouble, right? Because that is uh, the kind of expertise and the kind of trust that you put into someone uh, who really knows about this. And then uh, an open question for you guys, and I'll finish with this. Uh, should online learning uh, be a space uh, that uh, um, focuses more on complementing this teacher expertise? And uh, yeah, let me just finish with this. I had a couple more things, but uh, I will finish here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Javier. Yeah, we just have a couple of minutes, so quickly get some questions in here. Um, so I'm curious what you think. Um, I know Lingoda is more about group classes um, and what you think um, the, the positives are to having a group class compared to, let's say, like a one-on-one -on -one lesson. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm personally a big fan of group classes because I think uh, in group classes um, you really have the chance to uh, use language in a way that is uh, closer to uh, the normal environment in which you use language, for instance, at a company, for instance, uh, uh, 
with friends, etc. Right? It it uh, provides for a scenario in which uh, uh, the meaningfulness of, uh, of of the language of the linguistic use can happen in in a more organic way. Um, this doesn't mean that it's a solution for everybody, of course. Uh, there's uh, some people who are quite shy, who uh, really feel all this uh, kind of like fear of being judged by others in the class, right? And this is always uh, kind of like a like a tricky thing. And they would they would rather say, "I prefer a private class where I feel more comfortable and and uh, uh, kind of um, um, in in this kind of closed environment." But uh, I will I will. Kind of like encourage everyone to really go ahead and and, and be bold and uh, not really uh, let them be driven by this fear of being judged uh, because at the end of the day this is something that is at the heart of learning the language right uh, if you're an a1 or an a2 student you're gonna make mistakes for a very long time until you get uh, to a certain level of fluency and you need to be able to cope with this somehow definitely um and what do you say to people who say i don't like learning a language in the classroom <laughs> I think I would first ask, what do you mean by classroom, right? <laughs> because of course, uh, um, it's it's uh, what I was explaining is that we have this old concept of the classroom with a teacher at the center who tells you all the theory, grammar. Now learn by heart all these vocabulary items. Uh, this is something that is very old fashioned and that. Uh, at least the good offline schools also don't do anymore. And that uh, online learning kind of like fights against this old concept. But uh, the point that I want to that that I wanna bring here is that uh, there, there is also value in acknowledging that teachers from the offline world that are moving on to the online world now, uh, especially due to the coronavirus situation, but also before, um, uh, are bringing all this expertise uh, of like redefined teacher concepts, focusing on macro strategies and not so much on like applying every, the method very Exactly. And uh, I think this this has a, a lot of value and that online learning should also profit from that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today, Javier. Um, we really appreciate you jumping in there. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we'll be back in just a moment with our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you.